Yeah. That means first I will talk. First I will talk. Uh, dear pure urology viewers, uh, good evening, one and all. As you all know, we are conducting these programs uh, focused on the surgical technique based uh, in urology. Today, it is actually totally a different pathology, which is not normal, not normally seen, not normally heard. We all see the pudendal nerve only during the dissection of the lymph nodes in malignancies. You have seen with robot, you have robotic technology, you have seen with laparoscopic technology, but particularly going to that area for specific pathology is the topic today. And uh, there is no need to introduce Dr. Renard Bolens. Even in India, majority of the uh, majority of the urologists follow his surgical skills. He is gifted laparoscopic. He has gifted laparoscopic surgical skills. Who has trained many in the world. Uh, Professor Dr. Renard Boland, sir, thank you for joining with us. I will ask you briefly about your career for two, three minutes. Then I will introduce you officially, then hand over the program to you. This will be only two, three minutes. How did you, how did you, hello, sir. Morning, good afternoon. Sorry, it's a little bit later in, in, in uh, 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 how, how did you, how did you start your surgical career? Who is your mentor in your, in your, uh, in your medical schooling, what made you to enter the surgical career? First question. Well, I'm studying in Brussels, in the Free uh, University of Brussels, in um, uh, Erasmus Hospital. My, my chief was uh, Professor Schulman, who uh, was the, the editor chief for uh, 20 years or more of the European uh, Journal of Urology. And um, I arrived in the department just on the good time. It was uh, at the end of the 90s when the, the radical laparoscopic uh, prostatectomy was the really new uh, advance in, um, in neurology. And uh, I started uh, uh, to perform laparoscopic surgery uh, in 1999. At that time, I was uh, still a junior uh, trainee and I have developed uh, laparoscopic uh, surgery and knowledge uh, in the early phase of uh, the technique in in the world. So, in uh, the laparoscopic surgery is actually two-dimensional imaginative surgery. How did you develop your skill? You are intrinsically you got that, or you practice number of hours on the modules, or you have workload so that directly on patients you could learn. What what is the how do how did you acquire such skill? Well, of course. At that time, it was not a, a learning curve, it was a discovery curve because nobody knows exactly what we should do. And of course, uh, uh, actually, it's impossible to accept that someone has a still a discovery curve. And it's very important for me to train and to give, uh, to share our experience to avoid that discovery curve. I say always to my fellows that I will suppress that, but the learning curve will stay uh, faced to them uh, when they left my, my department. Uh, but I think that it's not so hard to learn laparoscopy when I see the, the fellows after just three months of training, 80% uh, of them are able to, to start a, a loan a laparoscopic program. And finally, it's just a question of, uh, of knowledge, much more than a question of skill. And also, actually, with the new 3D system, it's much, much more easy to learn laparoscopy because uh, at the beginning, it was just uh, with the 2D video system. Huh? Uh -huh. So, in laparoscopic suturing particularly, uh, do you think again knowledge is uh, equally important about the holding the scope, uh, holding the uh, needle and different methods of uh, suturing left hand, right hand, uh, various type of knots for the beginners because you are a mentor, you will be knowing how each, uh, each fellow uh, will learn in the, uh, different, even we have fellowship some in RIRS. Uh, some fellows will uh, learn within one month. W what do you think uh, important point for the fellow point of view to learn the skill which you acquired? Uh, for sut suturing is always something to stress the beginner, but uh, it's the only thing that I'm sure is 100% of the fellows after three months are able to suture. Right. Uh, it's sometimes more difficult for me uh, to start uh, with someone who has already a previous experience because uh, 
uh, the, it's really common that they have a, a non-efficient habit. Then I have first to wash the brain and to restart from, uh, from uh, <laughs> to, to, to give them the uh, more efficient tips and tricks. Uh, if people are interested about, uh, about the basic techniques and particularly suturing technique that I use, uh, I have a, a YouTube channel with a lot of videos for the, for the, the, the urologists and people who are interested. And one of the video is uh, basic techniques in laparoscopy and I give really uh, all the tips and tricks and the steps uh, to make the suturing in an efficient manner. Very and good. Very interesting and it's really helpful. Fantastic. Well, fortunate to have teachers. Uh, I am uh, going to introduce you in one slide. Uh, dear friends, uh, we will be starting now the topic uh, laparoscopic approach of pudendal pathology a new understanding of functional pelvic perineal syndrome by Dr. Renard Bolens. Uh, Dr. Renard Bolens is an urologist practicing in Belgium, France and Luxembourg. So how, how come uh, in three places you are practicing unusual to see this uh, fast sentence? Uh, great. You travel all these three places. Uh, how, how is it possible? Yeah, in fact, Belgium is a very small country. Then very quickly uh, you are outside the country and I live uh, 30 kilometers far from the French border. Lille is also uh, like 10 kilometers from, far from the Belgian border. That finally between my house and the hospital, I have maybe uh, 50 kilometers, no more. Uh, for Luxembourg, I, I go there just once a month because it's more far, it's uh, 250 kilometers from my house. But uh, I go yeah. there in the evening, I have a nice dinner with my friends there and we operate uh, three or four patients uh, the, 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 on Friday and I return back at home the, during the evening. Then right. it's uh, more touch and go. But of course, when uh, I operate in all this hospital, uh, I'm just like a, a skill monkey. I arrive, I operate the patients and I come back. Then I never see the patient before and I will never follow the patient after. I'm just there like a technician uh, uh, in France for the teaching because uh, they have uh, uh, local uh, fellows and I train them uh, but in Luxembourg uh, I, I go there just uh, for to perform the surgery. Great. It's not like uh, uh, it's a locum fellow. You, you have a lot of perfectly email may reach Luxembourg. So he is specialized in laparoscopy neurology and in functional neurology related with pudendal pathology. He's the author of the book Manual of Laparoscopic Urology demonstrated laparoscopic life surgery in more than 20 countries. He is conducting training program in laparoscopy and urology in association with the Belgian laparoscopic urology group since 2002. He is active member of BAU, BLUG, SBU, all the uh, local urology societies. He has more than 65 publications in many international journal and books. So with this introduction, I will hand over the program. Thank you once again, Dr. Renard Bolens for the kind uh, accepting the invitation. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. you. Then, uh, uh, do you have my, um, my screen now? I think that I have to share, share my screen. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, you are on it. Okay, perfect. And I just start the slide. Uh, the yes, pillar nerve uh, entrapment and the pillar nerve pathology is a very, very long subject. I have just one hour to speak about a subject, but I should uh, speak uh, probably for more than three hours to explain everything. <laughs> I discovered this pathology in 2014 uh, because I was in a uh, challenge in laparoscopy in Barcelona and I've seen uh, Tibet Erdogan. Uh, is from Turkey, uh, Istanbul, uh, performing a, a pudendal nerve release laparoscopically. After 2014, I'm start to be interested about that pathology because uh, I always uh, uh, take care about all the surgery uh, feasible laparoscopically. And I start to, to take care about the patients in my consultation. But of course, with the, the feedback of the patient, it's very important to have the feedback of the patients to understand that pathology. We observe that in fact, we have an evolution of the understanding of this pathology. In 2014, we just take care about pudendal neuralgia. It means the patients who suffer from pain. But very quickly, we discovered that the patient also have functional problem associated with the pain. And we prefer to speak about the pudendal neuropathy because many patients 
doesn't have pain, but they have functional problem. And step by step, we realize that also the artery, the pudendal artery can be compressed and give also their specific complication and specific syndrome. And we have also probably uh, some patients who suffer from uh, pudendal compression of the uh, uh, vein system. That's uh, very important to remember that finally, it's not only a nerve compression, it's a compression of the nerve of the artery and the vein. And if you understand that, you can explain many symptoms that you see every day in your consultation. Just a, a small uh, 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 anatomical uh, description then. The pudendal nerve is coming from S2, S3 and S4 roots. Uh, it runs uh, between the sacrocytic ligament and the pyramidal muscle. At that level is uh, located with the roots of the sciatic nerves. And it's also important to understand the pseudosciatalgia described by the patient. And it's only after uh, that he enter inside the alcocanal itself. The alcocanal is the duplication of the obturatory muscle. And it's also important to remember that the rectal branch doesn't pass inside the alcocanal because he left the main trunk just before to enter in the alcocanal. It gives a specific uh, also uh, uh, clinic and symptoms uh, for this reason. Now, um, just to show you some uh, anatomical picture, you can see here in blue the pudendal nerve, and you see that it runs with the, the sciatic nerve. The difference is that the sciatic nerve left the pelvis before the sciatic spine and the pudendal nerve left the pelvis after the sciatic spine. It's uh, arrived in the uh, pe uh, pineal area and at that level it's divided in three branches. One is the anterior branches who goes at the level of the clitoris and the penis but also at the a level of the pubic area. Then you can have patients who suffer from pubalgia related with the pudendal nerve. You have a medium branch and you have a posterior branch. And finally, all the perineum from the tip of the coccyx to the pubic bone can be uh, 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 interested about uh, that pathology. We have two major ligaments in this pathology. You have the sacrosciatic ligament uh, at this level. Uh, this ligament is one of the two parts uh, who block the nerve. Uh, the most, it's the most common place where it's blocked. Uh, you can see here the sacrocytic ligament and you have the grand tuberous ligament with more uh, externally located. When we do uh, open surgery, we have to sacrifice both ligament and it's probably one of the advantage of laparoscopic approach. We don't need to sacrifice the, the two ligament. It's also important to remember that it's not the only nerve who gives a problem at the level of the peridium. You have the clunial nerve with a specifically a sensitive nerve you have the genitofemoral nerve, and you have also the ilioinguinal nerve, who goes more anteriorly in the, in the perineum. It's a very common pathology. Huh? In fact, we consider that 15% of the women present uh, some symptoms more or less important related with this uh, uh, pathology. But uh, probably the, the problem is uh, why, widely underestimated because uh, many symptoms that we see every day in our consultation uh, are not officially related with the pudendal nerve entrapment, but with the experience that I have and the, the feedback of my patients, I, I discover many of them uh, in this pathology. What is also interesting is the, the lack of knowledge because when the patients arrive with the symptoms, usually the delay, the mean delay between the symptoms and the good diagnosis is five years, but I have in my consultation, some patients who have more than 30 or 40 years of symptoms and nobody has never given the diagnosis of uh, pudendal neuropathy. The symptoms can uh, appear progressively, but it can also uh, appear uh, in acute manner. For example, you can have a, a trigger event like a urinary infection or small trauma. Uh, it's the story of the patient who fell uh, on the coccyx and after he developed a, a pudendal neuropathy. But what is very important for the surgeon, it can be also a complication after the surgery. I have many patients who describe uh, pudendal nerve entrapment symptoms after many different surgeries, like uh, 
uh, hysterectomy through the vagina, amputation of the rectum, or uh, prostate resection, bladder resection, also ureteroscopy. And the common point with all this uh, surgery is the position. If you place a patient in gynecological position for a surgery, uh, it can be very short like a subetral sling. If the patient have a pain or strange symptoms after, you have to think that it's maybe uh, put down nerve decompensation. If you miss it, you have a high risk to finish in court of justice because nobody will understand what's happened. But uh, I know at least uh, two urologists who were prosecuted for that problem and were, were recognized guilty. Officially also, it's uh, mainly a female pathology. Uh, the, they say nine women for one man. The classical profile is a woman uh, uh, older than 35 years uh, who had already a uh, delivery. But in fact, it's not completely true. You have also a, a young group of patients who can have symptoms who appear uh, uh, at the end of the puberty or uh, in a young adult. It's very important to know that uh, it can be a, a very, very early, the, the appearance of the symptoms. Uh, this week, I've seen a patient uh, with typical symptoms and he was uh, 16 years old and is very, very young. It's also very important to ask uh, to the patient uh, what are the other problems that they have in the, the perineum because of course the patient will come in your consultation with the main uh, complaint but it's really common to have a patient who have consultation previously with the proctologist, the gynecologist or the urologist, the dermatologist and unfortunately some of them also finish in the psychiatrist consultation. The other risk for this pathology is to have a lot of surgery for nothing. I have seen patients, uh, the worst that I have seen was a patient uh, 50, 50 years old who finished with the cystectomy breaker and uh, the symptoms stay after the surgery because it was a, a pedalar nerve entrapment. What is very interesting is uh, if you operate a patient with a pedalar nerve entrapment, during the first uh, week, the patient will be perfect without any symptoms is not related with the surgery, it's related with the, the general anesthesia. Then it's uh, really problematic because the surgeon will believe that the surgery was efficient because the pain disappeared, but it's uh, related with the general anesthesia. It's something very well known in the patient who suffer from uh, facial uh, neuralgia. Uh, when the pain is too acute to avoid uh, a suicide, we can sleep the patient, just do just uh, sleeping the, the patient and the pain will release for uh, seven to 10 days. And it's important to know that. The mechanism uh, to injure the nerve is uh, two, finally. When you think about how we can explain the injury of the nerve, you have two mechanisms. The first one is a compression and the other one is stretching of the, of the nerve. The compression, as I told you, is uh, mainly between the sacrospinous ligament and the piriformis muscle. Uh, it's also in the Alcock canal. Everybody speak about uh, the Alcock canal syndrome, but in fact, it's not so common to be in the Alcock canal. It's much more commonly uh, before the Alcock canal that we have the, the compression. And it's also important to remember that you can have uh, external compression, particularly uh, for people who use a, a saddle in the, the sport activity. Then the first sport activity is a bicycle because uh, we use, uh, they use a saddle who is really thin and push up the smooth part of the perineum. When it's happened, the nerve is pushing and compressed on the, the sacrospinous ligament. But it's uh, really common. For the bicycle, the worst is the, the VTT, who is uh, very uh, bad for the, the pedal nerve entrapment. You can have also a risk of uh, stretching of the nerve. Uh, it's true if you have uh, some sport activity where you split the, the legs, like if you practice uh, the classic dance or the karate, but also uh, in a specific problem or in the woman is the descending perineum syndrome. Is uh, the perineum is completely loose, and when uh, the perineum is completely loose, the, the perineum is completely loose. It gives a, a traction on the branch of the perineum, particularly on the rectal branch of the pudendal nerve. And it's uh, important to know that problem because if you release the nerve and the patient has a descending perineum syndrome, maybe uh, you will not have uh, the recovery of the nerve if you don't stabilize the, the perineum in the same time. That's finally 
very easy to understand is compression or traction. But the question is uh, finally why we have the compression because traction is easy to understand, but the, the, the other problem is the compression. Uh, I work with my wife who is a gynecologist and uh, we follow patients uh, uh, from our consultation. And we observed that it was uh, more commonly the right side was uh, problematic. And it was when it was not the right side, statistically, the patient was uh, more uh, left-hander. Then you have a strange obs uh, clinical observation. And if you read in the literature is also uh, associated with the risk uh, uh, when you have uh, one leg shorter than the other one. Then uh, starting from this uh, observation, we have done some research and our conclusion is uh, very interesting because it's uh, a part of the of the treatment. The problem is uh, the, the risk uh, to develop uh, unbalanced and bone pelvis. If you have one extra order, you can have uh, the bone pelvis with uh, anteriorly rotated. And when the bone pelvis is anteriorly rotated, you develop a myofascial syndrome. And myofascial syndrome means that many muscles can be contracted by reflex in your body, and it can give a lot of problem. After that observation, we start to send all the patients to measure the length of the legs, and we observe that finally, many patients doesn't have an asymmetry. The problem is not a real uh, leg shorter in many cases, it's just a question of postural uh, bad habit. When you are a right handler, we have the tendency to flex a little bit the right knee, and in this manner, you create one leg shorter functionally. And it's exactly the same effect that if you have a anatomically one leg shorter, then it gives this uh, anterior pelvis rotation and the development of a myofascial syndrome. These muscles who are contract in the myofascial syndrome can be painful by themselves, but it can be also the origin of many conflict with the nerves in your body. The muscles, the first muscle who can be concerned uh, with the contracture is the fascia lata muscle in the tight. And with the excess of tension, it gives uh, classically uh, external gonalgia, but it's increased the risk also of trochanteritis. And if you have patients who suffer from chronic trochanteritis, it's uh, probably a, a postural problem. You have in the buttock the piriformis muscle, which is also contract. And these muscles, when it's contract, can push and increase the pressure on the pudendal nerve, but also on the sciatic roots. Then it's a, a association, a classical association, a, a pudendal nerve and pseudo sciatalgia. Pseudo sciatalgia means that the sciatic symptoms start not from the vertebral column, but start from the buttock and descend in the in the feet. When you move up, you have also the paravertebral muscle who can be contract and it can be responsible uh, about uh, uh, lower chronic back pain, but it can give also a conflict in the middle of the back and, and uh, give a compression of a nerve uh, and gives the Robert Main syndrome. This uh, nerves, when it's uh, compressed, give uh, the pain in the territory shown on the picture. And for the urologist, is a, a pain, a specific pain in the epididymitis in the scrotum. That's uh, really common and is also associated with the postural problem. And uh, you can have also, when you have a contracture of the muscle in the cervical area, uh, stimulation of the Arnold's nerve, and you have patients who suffer from headache due to that pro uh, postural problem. Finally, if you, if you try to analyze the etiopathology, we have in the center of the problem, the problem of the unbalanced pelvis. The unbalanced pelvis gives a myofascial syndrome. The myofascial syndrome can give muscle spin and the muscle spin can give, the muscles contractures can give also a muscular nervous conflict in many places. What is interesting is we can also enter a different uh, uh, observation in this, uh, in this uh, mechanism. You have the trauma is the story of the patient who fell on the coccyx. He has a light pain. And after one week or a few days, he developed a real classical pedal nerve symptoms. Why? Because when you have a light trauma of the coccyx, as usual, the body tries to fix the, the painful area and it's create a contracture of the muscles of the pelvis. And this is the reason why from a, a coccygeal problem, you can finish with the pedal nerve symptoms. We can also enter probably also 
the risk factor of sexual abuse who can create a, uh, due to a psychological effect, a contracture of all the muscles of the cranium. What is also important to remember is the unbalanced bone pelvis is not only a problem of legs and, and feet problem, it can be also uh, due to a problem of impairment of, uh, of the eyes and also a problem with the mandibular joint pathology. If you have a problem at that level, you can modify the position of your head chronically. Huh? If you have one eye is better than the other one, you will have the tendency to always put in front of you the best eyes to open the angle of you. And this rotation of the cervical uh, colon will be transmitted to the lumbar area also. It's uh, important to remember because uh, it's one place where we can uh, uh, try to correct uh, the, the problem. Finally, when we analyze uh, the, 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 the story of the patients, we have the postural problem that I discussed, is one with fracture. We have a trigger factors, the trauma, the infection, or the, after the surgery or the delivery. You have the local condition is all what we can observe when we operate the patient. We have sometimes a very strong fibrosis, but you can have also inflammation, for example, when the patient had uh, endometriosis, it's really common to have uh, uh, inflammation in the tissue, uh, in the pelvis. But sometimes you have also a uh, hernia, uh, a piece of fat to descend under the ligament, the sigrosciatic uh, ligament. And you have uh, also some dilated vein, but the dilated vein is very difficult to know if it's uh, uh, an effect or uh, origin of the compression of the, of, the, of the nerve. And you have the external factor like the sport activity or some professions. The patient who works all the day, all along the day in the seated position has a high risk of to develop this pathology. And also, for example, the, the, the use of high heel shoes uh, increase the anterior rotation of the pelvis and uh, increase also for this reason, the risk of compression of the pudendal nerve, then someone who has a pudendal nerve symptom should not use this kind of shoes. And if you look that somewhere between, in the middle of all this uh, risk factor, the patient will develop uh, the symptoms. To understand the clinical aspect of this pathology, it's also very important to remember that you have a nerve and artery, a vein, but also in the nerve, we have different fibers. We have sensitive fibers, or thin fibers, you have motric fibers, and you have sympathetic fibers. It's also important to remember that dependently of the intensity of the compression, the symptoms can be completely opposite. If you have a light irritation of the sensitive fibers, it will give allodynia. The allodynia is a painful sensation for a very light stimulation. But if you continue to crash, to push more on the nerve, uh, you finish to stop completely the, the nervous influx and you finish with the anesthesia. In the same with the motric fibers, if you give a small irritation of the motric fibers, you will have a hyper of the of the sphincter and the muscles. But if you continue to push harder, you stop the influx and you finish with the opposite is the hypotonicity and the palsy of the muscles. The sympathetic fibers is also interesting because uh, we can have patients who describe some very strange symptoms like uh, the impression of uh, skin redness and also swelling of uh, only one part of the scrotum and is typically a sign of a uh, problem with the sympathetic uh, nervous system. Well, if you look at the sensitive fibers and all the symptoms described by the patient uh, related with, the, with this problem, we have, of course, the perineal pain, and this is the, the, the well-known uh, symptoms of the pedal nerve entrapment, but you have also the urethralgia. Everybody has seen in the consultation in neurology some patients impossible to, to, to catheterize because uh, they have a lot of pain when we try to put a bladder catheter or when we try to, to do a cystoscopy. When you have a patient who has a, a, a very sensitive urethra, it's a very specific of a pudendal nerve uh, entrapment. Of course, if he doesn't have uh, uh, urethritis uh, due to an infection, but in the uh, uh, non-infected patient is a 100% or more or less 100% uh, neurological problem related with the pudendal nerve. We have also the patients who suffer from urinary symptoms like uh, sterile cystitis and the chronic prostatitis. For me, the chronic prostatitis probably doesn't exist. 
It's one thing that I discovered with my patient. I remember that I operated a patient who had a burning in the scrotum. And he told me before the surgery that he has also chronic prostatitis. And I, I answered him, oh, the chronic prostatitis is a, another pathology. These symptoms will stay. And uh, after the surgery, as the patients who told me that, you know, uh, the chronic prostatitis symptoms uh, disappear completely since the, the surgery, then actually I think that this pathology is clearly related with, uh, with the pudendal nerve entrapment, and it's finally the equivalent of the sterile cystitis that we see uh, in the woman. The urge incontinence is also uh, very interesting because uh, we continue to give to the woman who present urge incontinence uh, anticholinergic drugs. But if we think about when we do uh, eudynamics, it's very, very uncommon to find the unstable bladder, but we continue to give uh, uh, this uh, drug. And finally, when you see the acceptance uh, of this drug, many patients stop the, to use the anticholinergic drug when the placebo effect is finished. That's uh, one thing. And it's uh, uh, a symptoms who is related in the woman for me uh, with the lack of hormones in the menopause of patient, with the mobility of the urethra when the patient has the stress incontinence. But uh, in the other case, it's probably uh, mainly uh, pedal nerve uh, entrapment symptoms. Uh, what is very interesting is uh, if you correct uh, the postural problem, you can uh, have uh, these symptoms to disappear completely. Practically, I've seen a few patients. Uh, I remember one who was uh, 30 years old. She was a nurse. She needs to pee each 20 minutes during the day. And I just put insulin in the shoes to correct uh, the postural problem, and it disappeared completely. Then it means that you can uh, treat sometimes the urge incontinence with just insulin in the shoes without any treatment. We have also uh, other problems like the sexual symptoms. Uh, we have the premature ejaculation. We learn in, uh, in the university that the premature ejaculation is a psychological problem. For me, it's completely false because uh, I have uh, patients who suffer from that problem. And when you operate them for uh, prenatal nerve entrapment, this symptom disappear. And what is very interesting is we have uh, equivalent symptoms in the woman. Is a erosal syndrome is a woman who have a spontaneous pre-orgasmic symptoms. And finally, on both sides is the hypersensitivity of the fibers who gives the orgasm on both sides. And I operate patients with these symptoms. I remember that it was the, the major symptoms of a woman that she was 28 and uh, she was cashier in a supermarket. She was seated all along the day and uh, three times a day between the milks and, the, uh, and the, 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 the vegetables. She had the beginning of a spontaneous orgasm was of course very difficult socially to, to accept. And I operate her for that problem and the problem disappeared completely. And it's very important to, to remember that the premature ejaculation is uh, very specific symptoms, like the urethralgia is a very specific symptoms of the pedal entrapment. We have also the problem of the dyspareunia. The dyspareunia is two, two types of uh, dyspareunia in the woman. You have a superficial dyspareunia related with the hypersensitivity of the skin and the mucosa, but you have also a deep dyspareunia because in some position, the, the, the man can push on uh, some uh, painful point inside the, the, the pelvis, like uh, the doctors does when they examine the patient, we put the fingers in the vagina and we push in different point. If you stimulate that point, the patients can have uh, also pain. And another thing uh, described by the patient is the impression of foreign body in the vagina. And of course, it can be related with the prolapse, but we, we must always be careful uh, if we don't want to operate uh, some patients for nothing. Uh, I operate the patient who had uh, uh, a huge prolapse. The vagina was uh, completely inverted uh, between the, the legs. Then I did the promoter fixation. She come back in my consultation. She told me I have still the impression of foreign body in my vagina. I examined she had a cystocele grade one, maybe two when she is pushing but she was so annoying that I decided to operate her to restretch a little bit the mesh. She come back in my consultation. She told me I have still the impression of right body. Then I decided to operate her to replace uh, differently the, the anterior mesh to correct better the cystocele. She come back in my consultation. She told me uh, I have still the impression of right body. I examine her. 
and she had a zero of C to C. And it's only at that moment that I re remember that maybe it can be a, a pre-down level treatment. And uh, finally, I have released uh, her nerve and the symptom disappear. The anorectal symptom is also classically uh, the, the impression of a uh, foreign body uh, in, the, in the rectum. If you have someone who told you that he has these symptoms, if he doesn't have a big tumor in the rectum, you can be pretty sure that it's a penile nerve entrapment. Well, you have also a, a lot of symptoms related with the motric fiber stimulation. Uh, one uh, problem uh, is at the level of the urinary symptoms, you have a spasm of the sphincter. It means that you have a dyssynergia or you can have also urinary tension. And this is also something that we have to remember. I have operated a young woman, 50 years old, 53 years old, uh, for urinary tension. Uh, she was unable to do self catheterization due to the uh, hypersensitivity of the urethra, and she had uh, Mitrofanov. And I uh, reoperated her to, to improve the, the quality of the Mitrofanov, but I also released the pitadal nerve. And six months later, she had uh, a, a normal micturition, and I closed the. Um, the Mitrofanov. No, she is uh, more than one years later, and she had a complete uh, normal life, and she renate uh, without uh, post voiding residue. Then the dyssynergia, you, it's well known in the woman. We believe that uh, women are, are uh, crazy or stupid, that they cannot release the penium, but in fact, it's not their fault. It's a, a, a problem of pedal nerve entrapment who give uh, hypertonicity of the, of the perineum and the sphincter. What is interesting is uh, the, the, the impact of uh, the pudendal nerve on the high PSA. Everybody have in the consultation, uh, some patients with high PSA and we don't know why. What I observe is uh, some of these patients, when you discuss with them, have uh, some symptoms of pudendal nerve entrapment. And when you treat them for the pudendal nerve entrapment, the PSA drop down. Like that, it seems a bit strange, but in fact, it's completely logical. Because if you have a hypertenuosity of the sphincter, it's like if you have a conical stenosis in the urethra, it gives a, a outlet obstruction of the urine. And for this reason, you have a risk of increasing of the PSA. We have also the problem of the, the infection because uh, this patient presents a, a real bacterial cystitis with a higher frequency than a normal patient. And when we operate the patient, this problem has a tendency to disappear. The explanation is uh, probably when the patient had uh, a high platonicity of the, of the perineum, uh, sometimes, sometimes you have a compression of the muscle on the retral glands and you have a, like an ejaculation of this liquid who is always contaminated uh, normally in many patients. And um, you have like a massive bacterial contamination of the retra who gives uh, a high risk of uh, bacterial cystitis. It's one symptom described by the patient, usually is not a real big problem, but it's uh, not so uncommon, is the, the loose of uh, liquid coming from the urethra. Uh, it's, uh, I've operated also a patient 23 years old, and his main complaint was the, the urethral gland leak. Uh, every day between 10 and 11 o'clock in the morning, he has this leak, and he was drive completely crazy and he developed obsessional compulsive uh, habit to clean his hand for that reason. He was uh, completely crazy for them. Then I finished to operate him and he had uh, a pinned and nerve entrapment. Of course, the lack of relaxation uh, at the level of the vagina is responsible of the vaginism, but at the level of the rectum, it gives uh, also obstipation and dyscasia. What is very important to ask to your patient is not only if he is uh, obstipate, but it's also important to ask them, to them how many times they go to the toilet to try to poo, because uh, you can be surprised that some patient goes uh, four or five times a, a day. And of course, if they go four or five times a day, it's because they have a false sensation to need to go to the toilet. And it's a very, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good symptoms uh, related with the, the pedal nerve entrapment. The skin, uh, the sympathetic fibers give uh, uh, different uh, symptoms like the skin redness, the perineal swelling, or sometimes the skin edema. And uh, many patients uh, report a poor orgasmic sensation. I operate a patient also who, who has this uh, symptoms as a major symptom. It was the quality of the orgasm. And after the surgery, I asked him what about the quality of his orgasm? And he answered me 
that the first time the, he was so surprised about the intensity of the orgasm that uh, his wife believed that he mimicked an orgasm that was not a real one. Then it's also important to know that it can be a, a side effect of the pedenal neuropathy. What is also very important is to remember that we can have a compression of the artery. And uh, when you think about, we have a patient uh, 50 years old with erectile dysfunction, you send them uh, to check the coronary artery because we, we, we know that you have a high risk of coronaropathy. But the numbers of patients who come back with a stent in the coronaries is very low. And in my experience, maybe I've seen two patients who had a real uh, multiple arteriopathy. In many cases, the, the arteries are normal. And if you think about the diameters of the pitendal artery is more or less the same that the, the diameters of the pitendal, uh, the coronary and the pitendal artery have the same diameters. Then we should not have a, a pitendal arteriopathy if you don't have a coronary arteriopathy. And of course, when you have a young patient uh, who has erectile dysfunction, you are sure that he doesn't have uh, arteriopathy is another problem. But when you have a 50, 50 years old patient, it's probably not the age, but it's probably also the compression of the artery. Then actually, we operate patients for erectile dysfunction. Uh, and uh, it's uh, important to notice that when they have uh, erectile dysfunction, it's usually a bilateral problem. That is really common that you have to release both artery but we have a very good results uh, when we do that. It's also my patients who, who gives me this feedback about uh, the quality of the, the erection. They told me two things, that the, the, the erection was, uh, are better after the surgery. And also they give me uh, the information that they have the impression that the length of the penis in a flaccid position is also longer. Uh, it's, uh, some patients uh, in the, on my consultations when I was young come to with the major complaint that they have the impression that the penis is shorter in the flaccid position. I didn't understood what's happened at that time, but no, I know that it was a, a sign of pedenal artery. Some of patients also describe a cold gland of the penis. And uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Beko in Belgium, has studied the temperature of the, the gland before and after the compression. And he, he showed that the temperature of the, of the gland is increasing after the, the compression of the artery. What I realized uh, more recently is uh, the, the pathology of the vein. And you can have a pathology related with the compression uh, of the pudendal vein. You have some patients who describe a, a nocturnal hard erection. That's uh, uh, not common, but it's happened and it can be related with the obstruction of the venous system. But you have also another syndrome described uh, recently is the heart flaccid syndrome is a patient who has a continuously a tumescence of the penis, but when they want to have sexual activity, they don't have enough rigidity. And for me, the explanation is that because they have both compression of the artery and compression of the vein system. And if you, if you read the papers and the publication about uh, that pathology, they describe also many uh, functional symptoms associated who are completely compatible with the pudendal nerve compression that for me, is just a vascular uh, side of the compression of the pudendal element. I remember a patient that I operated and she had before the surgery an hemangioma, a very uh, ugly hemangioma on the vulva. And uh, she was surprised that the hemangioma disappeared after the surgery. And probably it was because I released also the, the pudendal vein during the surgery. Another point is the, the problem of the hemorrhoids uh, of the patients. I'm always surprised about the percentage of patients who present hemorrhoids when they have pudendal nerve entrapment. The pudendal veins is one of the exits uh, for the hemorrhoidal plexus. And maybe in some patients you can have thrombosis or uh, venous uh, particularity with a, a lack of uh, uh, exit who increase the risk of uh, hemorrhoids. It stay a question, but uh, I feel that uh, probably we have something behind uh, that clinical observation. Well, it's important to, to, to know the, the, the symptoms, but you have also the rhythm of the symptoms who is very interesting because uh, it's increased classically in the seated position. Uh, it's uh, became worse uh, and worse during the day. And it's uh, increased, the symptoms are increased uh, after sexual activity 
uh, usually with a delay of one or two days. And the crisis is uh, usually for one week. It decreases in the standard position during the night and when they are seat on the toilet, because when they are seat on the toilet, the perineum is pending in the toilet. That the, with the, the pending of the perineum, you do decompress the nerve and the patients can go better. It's probably the reason why some patients need uh, to, to, to read uh, some comics on the toilet is just maybe to wait that the nerves uh, is more free and they have a better relaxation of the anus. Of course, it's impossible to have a patient who present 100% of all the symptoms that I just described now. Uh, we have to be careful when you have a patient who has the night symptoms because it's possible if you have a severe pendendal nerve compression, but it's uh, also possible if you have a central nervous system pathology, and like a horse tail uh, uh, syndrome compression, you have to check the vertebral column to be sure that the, the patient doesn't have a problem at that level. And some patients, when uh, uh, it's a, a very severe compression, they can be symptomatic independently of, uh, of the position. What is important to remember is uh, the diagnosis is a clinical uh, uh, exam. Uh, you don't have uh, uh, an exam who can prove the diagnosis. It's the anamnesis and the clinical exam who will give you the, 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 the diagnosis. We, we search, uh, we examine the pineum of the patient with a, a skin rolling test. Uh, we just pinch the skin and we roll the skin to see if one side is more sensitive. And we check also the mucosa of the, of, the, of the gland, but also the entrance of the vagina. It's very important to, uh, to compare one side to the other one, because uh, of course uh, the sensation can be uh, unknown by the patient that they don't know what they have to feel normally. And we have always to compare the left from the right. We can push on the gluteal muscles to feel if the piriformis muscle is uh, painful and it's a sign of contraction at that level. Just above the anus, uh, under the, the pubic bone, we push deeply to see if one side is uh, more sensitive. And when we examine the perineum, of course, we have to examine the entire ganglia in the curvature of the coccyx. And the cluneal nerve wall is located in the external uh, part of the ischiatic tuberosity to exclude the problem at that level. What is important to remember is that if the patient has functional problem, is uh, specific to the pudendal nerve entrapment, but sometimes you can have patients who have uh, multiple nerves compression. The clinical exam, we do a digital rectal examination, and you have seen probably in your consultation some patients who, uh, when, uh, where it was impossible to enter all the fingers in the anus. It's not a crazy patient, it's a classical case, uh, it's classical situation of the patient that the uh, pudendal nerve entrapment, the, the digital rectal examination is very painful. What we have to do is just to enter the tip of the fingers inside the anus and give a lateral traction to feel if one side is more painful than the other one. And usually it gives you the lateralization. We put the fingers deep as possible in the vagina and we search the contact uh, of the, the acute steadiness of the levator and eye muscle. Some other authors speak about palpation of the internal of the artery muscle, but they are superposed. And when you push there, you push uh, on both uh, the acute steadiness and the internal obturatory muscle. And we go more posterolaterally from the rectum in direction of the sciatic spine to see if uh, the patient have a more uh, discomfort on one side. Sometimes the patient have a, uh, has a real pain, but sometimes it's just a, a, a discomfort. If you push harder on the muscle, few times the pain can disappear also. That's also important to know. If you, if you push a few times, the pain disappears like a massage of a, of a contracted muscle. It can be better if you do the massage uh, on the muscle. Complementary exam, that's a very good uh, point of discussion because patients and doctors want to see something to believe uh, the diagnosis, but it's very difficult because uh, the, the perineal electromyography is a very bad exam. It's more confusing than a good exam because yeah, it's important to remember that it tests only the motric fibers. Motric fibers is big fibers who are more resistant to the compression than the, the, than the sensitive fibers who are really thin. It means that you can have a, a lot of pain with the electromyography normal. It's just in case of abnormality is uh, an argument in favor of the diagnosis, but you can never exclude the diagnosis based on the EMG. 
the MRI tree Tesla, uh, it's more discussed because uh, for some radiologists uh, it's efficient, for the other one is uh, mainly uh, it's uh, it's mainly a business. But uh, I don't know. I don't have a, a clear answer about the the interests of the MRI. Uh, it's important to do MRI for the vertebral column, but also to exclude a, a big mass of, of the of the pelvis. But for the nerve itself, it's not so clear. The ultrasonography Doppler seems to be very interesting because it's a more specific and a sensitive uh, exam. Uh, but of course, the problem is uh, you need to know uh, radiologists specialized in that field and who knows exactly what is uh, the normal uh, aspect of the the pudendal uh, artery flow in the artery uh, to, to be able to detect the compression at that level. You'd never have one exam who is 100% sensitive and specific, and it gives just arguments, but you can never exclude the diagnosis, unfortunately, uh, based on the complementary exam. The treatment. Don't believe that we have to operate uh, all the patients. The first thing is to control the risk factor. And as I told you, it's important to, um, uh, to correct uh, the, the unbalanced bone pelvis with the orthopedic uh, sole, insole, if necessary. We do also uh, physiotherapy, postural physiotherapy and stretching exercise. You can see, uh, for example, here, this exercise is a typical exa exercise to stretch the piriformis muscle to try to relax the muscle. And if you do this true treatment, uh, the study that we have done shows 15% of completely uh, cured patient and 66% of improvement of the symptoms of the patient uh, in two thirds of the patients, more or less. If it doesn't work, we propose a, a decompression with the surgery. Finally, this uh, first approach of treatment tried to relax the piriformis muscle and to decompress the nerve. But uh, if it doesn't work, we have to cut the sacrocytic ligament to uh, reduce uh, the, the compression. Yeah, just uh, one second. Um, of course, we have to avoid uh, all the risk factor, no, no saddle, and you have to avoid the bicycle, motorbike, or horse riding. You avoid to, to use uh, high heel shoes uh, all along the day. No gynecological position if you, if you have to operate the patient, and you can use a specific cushion I don't like this kind of cushion. The anterior part is here, the posterior one is here, but when you use a specific cushion like that, you reduce the, the perineum pressure, but you increase the pressure on the peripheral area. And I've seen some patients who develop cranial nerve entrapment uh, due to use of this cushion. Personally, I prefer to use a more neutral cushion who gives a, a homogeneous pressure on all the perineum. The classical treatment for the, the neural nerve pain of course, as usual, we have the tramadol is a light uh, morphinic drug. You have uh, anti, uh, antidepressive drug, antiepileptic or, neuro, uh, or neuroleptic drugs. But usually the side effects of these drugs uh, are very important and not compatible with the social life. What is more, much more interesting is the use of tadalafil 5 milligrams. It's one thing that the patients report me when I put them under 5 milligrams tadalafil for erectile dysfunction. Uh, they told me that the, the, the other symptoms goes better also. And uh, finally, actually, we propose tadalafil also to the woman. And when we give the tadalafil 5 milligrams to the woman, uh, we have 50% uh, of good answer. The mechanism, of course, is not known, but I suppose that we increase the, the flow in the pudendal artery. And due to that, we increase the oxygenation of the nerve. And it's probably for this reason that the patients feel the, the, the improvement. It's important also to try to avoid uh, to use a strong morphinic drugs because the morphinic drugs will increase the sensitivity of the pain receptor. It means that the patient will need to take higher and higher dose and they will become junky before that the, 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 they realize the, the situation. That I prefer to avoid the morphinic drug particularly uh, for the patients who need to be operated. The pudendal nerve infiltration should not be placed in the treatment, but uh, in the diagnosis. Uh, the, it should be done under CT scan and not under ultrasonography because CT scan is much more accurate. And we inject the uh, local anesthesia. 
and corticosteroid, and usually for the CT scan, also a little bit of contrast. What is very important to explain to the patient, the local anesthesia will be efficient for maximum one day. After the, the local anesthesia has finished to, do, to be efficient, and due to the fact that you have inject excedent of liquid, the patient can have worsening of the symptoms for one week. After one week, they return in the basic line, in the baseline of the, of the symptoms because the liquid is resolved. And after uh, one or two weeks more, the corticosteroid can be efficient. Unfortunately, the corticosteroid is efficient in only 15% of the case. The majority of the patient will have just one day of, uh, of uh, improvement. Okay, but it's a test. If they have one day of improvement, you can confirm uh, the diagnosis without doubt. If it doesn't work, you get, have maybe a, a technical problem due to the, the injection, who is maybe not exactly on the good place. Surgical treatment. We have different uh, approach described. And uh, you have a transvaginal or transpenial approach. You have the transgluteal approach, which is the, 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 the most ancient and most uh, known uh, technique, but it's uh, very aggressive, the transgluteal. It gives a, a scar, big scar in the buttock. And uh, also when you cut here the, the gluteus muscle, you have uh, uh, the risk to, to injure some nerves behind. And I've seen some patients who had uh, pain due to the access and not to the release of the nerve. For me, laparoscopy is a very good option because it's uh, minimal invasive and give a good access uh, uh, on all the length of the, of the nerves. A question the, from the patient is, uh, when we cut this, the ligament, if it changes the stability uh, of, the, of the pelvis, uh, the known team has done uh, some study and they say, no, it doesn't change the stability. I'm not so sure. Because uh, of course, uh, when you go transglutally, you have to cut the the, uh, the tuberous ligament is this one, and you have to cut the sacrocytic ligament here. When you do a pitting and entrapment, you just cut the small one is the sacrocytic ligament. But my clinical observation is when you operate one side, 15% of the patient will need to be operated on the other side. Maybe it's because they have a bilateral problem uh, before, the other explanation is maybe when I cut one ligament on one side, I increase the tension on the other one, and you can maybe induce a decompensation on the other side. This is just uh, to remember that the nonce criteria for me is completely useless because they speak only about pain. They don't take care about the functional problem. And I think that if you use the not uh, criteria, you will exclude many patients who have the, uh, really a pudendal neuropathy. I have, uh, in my uh, experience, operate patients uh, reject in nonce because they didn't enter inside the criteria and operate them with the very good uh, results. And it's just the nonce uh, criteria well known. This is uh, the results of Tibet uh, after 27 cases with a follow-up uh, uh, around six months. It's important to know that six months is a transitory uh, results because uh, the definitive results is between six months and two years. That's uh, very important to know. And also uh, it's uh, important to explain to the patient what's happened after the surgery. Uh, during the first week, the patient doesn't have pain, as I told you, due to the general anesthesia. After you can have uh, the nurse recover with the worsening of the symptoms during usually one month. Then during the first month, 50% of the patient will have worse symptoms than before the surgery. It means that the symptoms that they have can be more intense, but it means also that they can have new symptoms. It can be sensitive symptoms, but also motric symptoms. I have one of my patients who stayed four months with the suprapubic catheter because he, he was in urinary tension after the surgery. That is very important to explain that to the patient. Um, the recovery needs between six months and two years. That's the classical uh, delay. But when you have uh, patients with a very, very long story, I have at least three patients in my experience who has to wait two years before to have the first uh, sign of, signal of recovery of the nerve. This is the location of the, of the compression. You can see that the alcohol canal is not the main uh, location of the, of the compression. It's more ischiatic spine and uh, sacrocytic ligament. As this is the, the, the results of the different technique. Actually, you can see that it was 75%, but it was the early uh, uh, results. 
actually we are more around 80, 85% because we have changed the, the patient selection. We operate many patients who, are, who doesn't have pain, but functional problem. It's the reason probably why actually we have a, a better uh, results. It's uh, also interesting to see that some patient who doesn't have the expected results recommend the surgery is the proof that it's a minimal invasive surgery and the patients uh, are ready to redo the surgery. And just uh, because it's very difficult to know if it works or not, we have just asked to the patient, what is your global quality of life? And before the surgery, it was four in Belgium, in the Belgian patient, to became 64.4 after the surgery, but you have to, to compare with the general population and the quality of life in Belgium uh, for the general population is 6.9. Then you can see that it's really close. It's a functional pathology and everything should be left to the choice of the patient, the complementary exam that they want to do, but also the treatment. Of course, we propose a logical sequences of the treatment, in sole, in the shoes, and postural physiotherapy if needed. And uh, if it doesn't work, uh, surgery. And for me, of course, the, due to the fact that we use a minimal invasive, we change completely the approach uh, for me with the laparoscopy, the surgery should be placed uh, uh, more or less on the first or the second line of treatment. Because uh, if you think about uh, when you have a pathology of nerve compression somewhere in the body, the first treatment is never to give drugs. The first treatment is always to decompress the nerve. And I think that the pedal nerve should follow the same rule. It's clearly underestimated. That's uh, also the conclusion of my experience. The pain is just the end stage of the evolution. And it's very important to detect the patient when they are still at the level of the functional problem to avoid that they goes and they finish with the, with the uncontrollable pain. And uh, it's uh, uh, very important uh, to, to remember that probably majority of the functional problem that we see in our consultation are related with the pedal problem. Uh, if you want to see uh, videos full length, uh, it's, they are available on my YouTube channel. And I want just to show you now a short videos from my wife. Uh, she's gynecologist and uh, she performs also a pedal nerve entrapment. I will just switch off the sound. Yeah. And, um, it's, uh, it's not a very difficult surgery, I know. One colleague uh, is located in uh, Norway who started uh, with dental decompression just after to have seen the, the, the videos on YouTube that I have published. And the first landmark is the umbilical artery. We incise vertically, lateral to the umbilical artery. That's the first landmark. It's very important to find uh, each landmark because it's very easy to be lost. It's not a place where we go commonly for uh, when we do the other surgery. And it's very important for this reason to remember and to find all the landmarks. Here we do a L incision uh, parallel to the uh, round ligament and we open the space. It's the same space that we open when we do a, a, a pelvic lymph node dissection. Then we can find here the lymphatic tissue. This is uh, the lymphatic tissue. We have uh, here the umbilical artery that we see very well. And we descend in the plane to find the optatory elements. The optatory elements are very important because we have to, to search the optatory vein origin. This is, of course, the optatory nerve. Just behind the optatory nerve, we will find the, the optatory artery that we can see well here. This is the optatory artery. But the most important is the optatory vein. This is the optatory vein. When we are at the level of the optatory vein, we have to change the plane because we have just to turn close to the vein, behind the vein, to arrive on the endopelvic fascia because this fat that she has on the grass is a lymphatic tissue. This lymphatic tissue can hide the beginning of the uh, sacrospinous ligament. And we clean. It's very important also to be really uh, bloodless because if it's not to be read, the surgery can be much more difficult. We peel down the pelvic fascia and we continue to open the, the plane to arrive at the origin of the optatory vein. Okay. We always be careful, coagulate carefully the small vessel. Yeah. 
for the small area in the in the in the wall. This is the umbilical artery, as I told you, the upper artery vein, the upper artery artery, the upper artery nerve. When we go closer, you recognize the arachnoid stellinis of the levator and eye muscle. This is the septic spine that is located just behind the, 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 the acus. This is the sacrocytic ligament. This is the levator and eye muscle. This is the lower part is the coccygeous muscle fibers uh, who cover a part of the ligament. And this is the internal operatory muscle. Okay, you can see that you have a hernia between the acus tendinis and the internal operatory muscle. It's really common to have that. In this case, we see that the vein is uh, a little bit too medial than inside the, the beginning of the ligament. Is the reason why we decide to pass between the nerves and, uh, and the vessels to have a better access on the beginning of the ligament. Tibet uh, just doesn't take care about the vein. He prefers to put a clip on it, but personally, I, I try to preserve, we try to preserve uh, as possible the structure. This is the beginning of the ligament that we see here. At the, the beginning, we really thin, but it's important to start at the beginning to be sure that we have cut completely all the ligament. We don't left anything compressing the, compressing the nerve. It's also very important to stay close to the wall, because if you don't stay close to the wall, you can miss the, the static spine, and you left a little bit of tissue on the static spine. If you left a little bit of tissue on the static spine, you will miss the entrance of the alcohol canal. That is important to stay always close to the wall. Okay, we you don't use the monopolar coagulation. We just take uh, carefully with the bipolar. Sometimes uh, I reduce also the intensity of the of the bipolar grasp. We have to be careful at that level because we are on the roots of the the septic nerve, and uh, sometimes we have a, a, a vein who runs with the septic nerves who can bleed uh, very nicely uh, if you injure it. Then we have to detach the posterior part of the, of the, the, the ligament to be sure that we don't uh, catch the vein with us when we cut the, the ligament. At this level, we arrive close to the spine and uh, we have some muscle fibers who covers the, the ligament. These muscle fibers are the uh, coccygeous muscle fiber. It can be more or less thick, and you can have also some anatomical variation, like duplication of the ligament. Sometimes you can have a part of the ligament and other additional muscle fibers under. Then you must be careful because it's not always uh, the same aspect. But the classical one is uh, one layer of muscle and the ligament under, who cover the who cover the the uh, element. Here we are close to the spine. We coagulate the, the muscle fibers because if not, it will bleed. And behind the muscle fibers, behind these muscle fibers, we will find the, the end of the, the ligament, of the sacrospinous ligament. We turn around the, the spine and we stay close to the spine. When we turn around the ligament, it's always important to, to uh, localize uh, the acute steadiness of the levator and eye muscle. Of course, it's uh, important to avoid uh, to take a risk about the continents uh, when we cut at that level. Now we can come back and you can see the fibrotic part of the ligament there is uh, much stronger. It's also the reason why we use a single use uh, monopolar scissors is just to be sure that it's strong, it's uh, sharp enough to cut well and cleanly the ligament. At this level, we can see here the static spine. You have the sacrocytic ligament, who is clean from the muscles uh, who cover the, the ligament. This is the pudendal nerve, and just before the spine, this is the sciatic nerve. This explanation also why some patients had a, a pseudo sciatalgia associate. I have operated some patients who suffer mainly due to the sciatic pain, and it's very efficient for that indication. The sciatic nerve is bigger and have a better uh, prognosis when it's decompressed. Always we push back the element with behind to try to minimize the thermic injury uh, when we use the bipolar. At the beginning, this surgery takes time huh, because uh, we are always careful, but actually 
for a simple case, uh, uh, the surgery took uh, between uh, 25, 30 minutes uh, when it's a non-previously operated patient. The worst situation, the worst scenario is the patients who had the radiotherapy. That's a, a very bad. It's happened two times that I have to stop the surgery because due to the radiotherapy, it was impossible to recognize that. Here, we arrive inside the alcohol canal, and it's at that level that we can uh, miss the alcohol canal if you don't stay close enough to the, to the, uh, uh, the sciatic spine. We try to start to transpose the, the pedal nerve, but to make our life more easy, we have to do a small additional incision above the sciatic spine. Like that, we arrive more uh, lateral than the alcohol canal, and it helps to uh, open completely the alcohol canal. Because as you can see here, it stays blocked inside the alcohol canal. Then we cut more higher. My wife prefers to cut with a cold knife, but personally, I use a small puncture of uh, uh, with the with the monopolar. And when we free the other side, we will be able to find the other part of the of the pedal nerve within the alcohol canal to release completely the the nerve. You can see that we have still a small thing attached there, and it's usually not inside the alcohol canal. Majority of the problem is the entrance, just at that level. When you have a problem in the alcohol canal, it's at that level that uh, you have the problem. The idea is to release all the length of the nerve. When we finish, it must be in the perineal fat. And the fat that you see there is the perineal fat. And uh, of course, it's uh, impossible to go in each specific branches of the pedernal nerve when we do a laparoscopic uh, approach because it's uh, on the other side of the of the of the axis. When we finish, the nerve is completely free and transpose. Here we have a small adherence with the, the pedernal artery, which is uh, located there. But the compression is uh, is enough, and that these patients recover completely the, the symptoms after a few months. As a final aspect, you can see also the pulsation in the pudendal artery. Pulsation in the pudendal artery is usually a good sign of uh, complete decompression. So, conclusion, it's of course uh, uh, very interesting, but it changed completely what we have learned. And I think that the main message of my presentation is that probably we have forgot the past to reinvent the future in the functional pathology of the pelvis and the pineum. Thanks for your attention. I'm open for questions. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, to ask the questions also, this is a complex subject. One needs to uh, know what it is. It's a more uh, first time I'm listening such an extensive talk on something related to perineal syndromes. Uh, basic questions I like to ask. Number one, most of this is bilateral. Would you like to do bilateral always? Uh, it's not uh, so common to be bilateral. Uh, it's majority of the patient at uh, one side who is, uh, who is the problematic. It's a uh, percent of the patients who have the bilateral problem. What is important, uh, it's a functional problem. That is the patient who has to decide if we do both sides. Uh, the first remark is uh, at the beginning of my experience, we operate both sides, the symptomatic and the, 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 the asymptomatic side, just preventively. Okay, that is the reason why I can I, I know when the nerve is blocked and when the nerve is not blocked because I've operated many nerves uh, who were not compressed. But one day I was in a very difficult case and I was just thinking during the surgery that if I, I don't have the expected result on the, the side compressed and I had an accident on the side who was in, asymptomatic, probably the patient will engage someone to kill me in the parking of the hospital. And I've stopped, <laughs> to, do a, stopped to do preventive surgery. That's the first thing. The second point is, of course, some patients have uh, typically a bilateral problem, but it's very important to explain to them that after the surgery, you have a transitory numbness of the perineum, including the anal, the anal canal. It's uh, not so infrequent. If you have complete anesthesia and numbness of the anal canal, you can have a fecal incontinence for a few months. 
And after that is the decision of the patient. But it's uh, the reason why, when is the patient who had the possibility to be operated uh, two times, I prefer to operate one side to wait three to six months that the, the, the sensitivity of the pineum is coming back before to, to operate the other side. But I have many patients who are coming from abroad. They have to pay everything by themselves. And many of them ask me to, to operate the two sides in the same time. But I, they have to be informed about the risk of uh, trans transitory fecal incontinence. Uh, the second question is, so many differential diagnoses are there. Is there any specific test uh, like stimulation, uh, nerve stimulation tests or anything like that before we say that after doing the surgery, the results will be better and uh, that, that it may disappear, all the symptoms may disappear because the perineal pathology is so wide, you explained, uh, right from UTI, sexual, this thing, uh, exercise, different type of uh, profession. Uh, so how can we be assured, how can we assure the patient that we can cure after doing this release? And uh, yeah. The first thing, it's very important to never promise anything. That's, I always say it's the question of statistic. You can say 85%, but of course, if in terms of one individual patient, uh, it's zero or 100%. Then I say always, it's the statistic is good for a group of patients, is never good for one single patient. That's the first point. The second point, of course, you have some prognostic factors that's evident. Then the, the good prognostic patient is a young patient because the young patient had a, a, a better recovery of the uh, and healing of the nerve. Uh, when the patients are very old, uh, it's much more difficult. The second point is uh, if the patient have a, a very long story of symptoms and um, if they have a long story of symptoms, uh, the prognosis is also worse. The second, the, the third point is if they have symptoms during the night. That's, I think, a very important point. If the patient uh, doesn't have symptoms during the night, it means that on the, the day, they have a recovery time. And if they have no symptoms in the night, it means also that the nerve is still alive. The question finally is in the timeline of the compression and the story of the patient where we are. But in one moment, if we wait too much time, the, the lesion will be irreversible. And if the patient uh, doesn't have symptoms in the night, it, see, it means that uh, it's not yet uh, irreversible lesion. The last uh, point uh, is if uh, they have a, a positive answer to the infiltration uh, test, it's also a good prognostic factor. But this is just prognostic factor. You have also yeah. a question of uh, the, which kind of symptoms that they have. For example, when you have urinary symptoms, at the beginning is just uh, urgencies. That's a good prognosis. But the problem is, when you have a pudendal nerve entrapment, you increase the risk of um, uh, intertissial cystitis. And probably the intertissial cystitis is an endpoint evolution of the pudendal nerve entrapment. Why? Because we know that when we have a, a lesion on the, on the pudendal nerve, we change the water tightness of the uh, mucosa of the bladder. And if you, it's proof, it's a study on the rats who showed that. And if you, if you imagine you have a, a modification of the water tightness, after you have the urine who can pass through the mucosa, the, muco the urine under the mucosa create a chronic a chemical inflammation. And this chronic clinical inflammation gives intertissial cystitis that you can observe when you do biopsies in the bladder. If you continue to wait, you will finish with the bladder who is completely shrink because you have the fibrosis. And of course, when you have real uh, anatomical lesion in the bladder, it's too late. If you release the nerve, the lesion in the bladder stay, and you cannot uh, repair with just uh, simply the releasing of the nerve. In this kind of situation, the prognosis is also poor. Then what I do, I release the nerve because we never know if it's reserved the, the, the reversibility of no, or not of the, of the problem. And if it's not enough, in the second time, I do a bladder augmentation. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, you, you told about so many uh, divisions of the nerves anterior, posterior. Will this procedure applicable to all the divisions or you have to be modified in, uh, in the sense, uh, all the nerve pathology, same procedure, all the branches? No, that's also important. As I, as I mentioned, you can divide, you can free the main trunk and the rectal branch, but not the other one. 
because the other one should be uh, abhorred by a perennial approach. But in my knowledge, you don't have so many uh, compression of the, the distal branches. The only one who is well known is the uh, 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 pathology of uh, people who practice bicycle. When they put the nose of the saddle too high, you block the base of the penis between the saddle nose and the pubic bone. And then you have a specific compression of the, of the penile branch of the pedal nerve, but it's really specific. And uh, for me, when we treat uh, the, the, the main trunk, probably it's uh, the, the, the problem, it solved the problem in the 90% of the, of the case. But in the 50% the, the of failure, 15% of failure, probably one part of them uh, is maybe a, a more distal uh, problem in the different branches. But it's very difficult to, to define the, exactly the location of uh, the compression. And I think that finally we can do a minimal invasive surgery uh, just to try and to see. And we know that statistically we have a high chance to be efficient. But it's true that we don't have access on the distal branch. How many surgeries you have done and uh, what is the commonest, uh, uh, commonest symptom, uh, five symptoms uh, which you have operated? I mean, uh, generally, uh, I'm not going into the absolute uh, uh, figures, but generally, uh, the number of cases you have done, if you see, what are the common five symptoms which they are suffering and we, after the surgery they are relieved? Well, the, the, the main symptoms, the most common, uh, because I'm a urologist also, then it's a bias of selection, but of course it's uh, urological symptoms. And that's uh, the first uh, reason why I operate. I have patients who have pain, uh, of course, because I have many patients who are uh, referred in my consultation. And my colleagues still continue to send me only the painful patient. That's probably the pain is the first uh, uh, reason to operate the patient. But in, uh, it depends also where I operate. Huh? I remember that uh, we operate patients in Lebanon. And uh, when uh, uh, the patients start to know that we, we correct the erectile dysfunction with this surgery, uh, suddenly we were overflowed with the male erectile dysfunction patient. And it was a, a big part of the activity uh, there. That is really dependent also where you are. And, uh, and what are the expectations of, uh, of the patient. But in my consultation, personally, it's probably a painful problem uh, and a urological problem. That's uh, the, the major. But I have also operated patients who had uh, uh, mainly uh, sciatic pain. Uh, it's uh, very strange, but uh, I have seen some patients who, who suffer the hell with the, the sciatic uh, uh, compression. And uh, I prayed them and uh, all of them were cured. And it's very important to, to know. And it's very easy to, to, to have the diagnosis, first of all, you have to ask them many questions to feel if they have symptoms of pedal nerve entrapment, who is really commonly associated. And second also is to ask to them where start the pain. If it starts from the buttock, it's a pseudo and you can treat uh, with the section of the, the, sciatic, the sacrocytic ligament. Well, do, you, do you think that uh, urology commonest problem we come across is chronic pel pelvic pain, CPPS, asked by the Purnanandam sir, that uh, chronic prostatic uh, pelvic pain, all these symptoms, uh, all these uh, syndromes, do you, what is the percentage of the people you are operating for? Because it's a huge subject, you phenomenal number of patients are suffering. We give anticholinergics, we give medicines, we give alphazosin. Uh, now this is opening a this is opening a new uh, new door uh, altogether. And your comment, uh, honest comment, uh, in the last uh, five ten years you are doing on this. Uh, it's it's the problem. Huh? When I explain my experience. Uh, you have, I have two reactions. The first uh, is, uh, ah, that's very interesting. Maybe we have to think in other manner. And the other one is, uh, is completely crazy. <laughs> it's the true opposite. But uh, of course, uh, I, I, I didn't receive another training than, than, you, than the other urologist. Is, uh, the, my, what I share here is the uh, ex experience that I have. I learn not in the book. I learn with my patients. Yeah. And the, Yes, you have to operate the patients to understand that problem. Because if you don't operate the patients, you cannot realize that the functional problems are pudendal uh, release uh, uh, related. Uh, that's a very important. At the beginning, I never believed that the, the chronic prostatitis was related with this, uh, with this pathology. It's my patients who, 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 who gives me this information. 
At the beginning, you see one patient who say, oh, okay, my, my conical prostatitis disappear. I say, oh, that's strange, but why? it's interesting. When you have three patients who explain the same thing, it changed completely your approach. The next patients who arrive with the conical prostatitis, you start to ask him if he has a, a premature ejaculation, uh, how many times he goes to the toilet. And surprisingly, you will see that all the patients, all of them will answer, will have the same profile. And uh, it's always the same. When I have a colleague who, who, who is in my consultation with me, they told me it's unbelievable. All the patients have the same description of the of the, the problem. But of course, you need to, to be completely open mind is what I told you. We have to, to, to burn the knowledge that we believe that we have in the past and we have to reinvent uh, the, the functional urology. But for me, if you ask to patients who suffer from conical prostatitis, you will see that they have in all cases uh, other symptoms compatible with pedal level entrapment. Of course, some patients some <laughs> told me- Sorry, yes, sorry. Sir. When you have conical prostatitis, you see calcification in the prostate. But it's not logical to have calcification in the prostate because when you have a conical prostatitis, when you have a pudendal nerve entrapment, you have a spasm of the sphincter. And when you have a spasm of the sphincter, each time that you go to urinate, you have a reflux of urine in the canals of the canal of the prostate. And it creates, like in the intertissial cystitis, you create chemical inflammation of the prostate and with the reaction, you have stones or pills in the, 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 the parenchyma of the prostate. Then for me, it's completely logical to have a, a real uh, calcification when you have a chronic prostatitis is related with the uh, lack of relaxation of the, of the, of the perineum. Okay. But you know, also when, when you speak about a prostatic problem, uh, we, we can give tadalafil 5 milligrams uh, a day in patients who suffer from prostatitis, prostatic, prostatism. Huh? It's a uh, one indication when you have urgencies. And if you look the the profile of these patients who have a good answer, they are usually young patients with a small prostate. In fact, we believe that we treat a prostatic problem, we treat a pudendal nerve problem. It's okay. like when you resect a patient with a small prostate, you do a prostate resection in a patient with a small prostate you know in your brain somewhere that this profile of patient has higher risk to be not happy after the surgery because he will continue yeah, yeah. to have these symptoms. Yeah, yeah. Because, because this patient has a high risk to be a pedanal nerve problem and not a prostate problem. I have operated patients like that, prostate resection, and after the surgery, patients completely in your retention. I say, okay, the blood is maybe a little bit tired. I left the catheter for 10 days. After I remove the catheter, still in urinary retention. Then I do cystoscopy because I believe that maybe I left a piece of adenoma somewhere. I pass the sphincter and it was completely open. I say, no, it's not obstructive. And at that moment, I think that maybe it's a pinal nerve entrapment. Then I digital right examination. He has an acute pain on one side. I send him for a filtration test and he will start to pee directly. Oh, great. Really appreciate it. It's very important to, to change completely our mind and to remember that the nerve is uh, uh, sensitive fibers and motric fibers. If you start with just that in your mind, you can understand many things that we didn't, that we never understand before. Great. So one question, last question. Uh, is there any role of uh, radio frequency ablation of the pudendal nerve or ganglion impar in this type of... Uh, uh, I, I, I doubt uh, this is asked by Pratap Kumar on the Pratap Kumar Gotimukala. Uh, do you have an answer for this radio frequency ablation of the pudendal nerve? Well, yes. Um, radio frequency, you have two type of uh, radio frequency. Huh? You have, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Do you hear me? I say you have two types of uh, radio frequency. You have a high peak temperature, but you will destroy completely the nerve. It means that you destroy also the motric fibers, including the, the fibers who goes to your sphincter. Then you have a risk to, to use the resistance of the sphincter. Then the best is to do a um, pulsated radio frequency. It's a, a not so high peak, but repeated uh, 43, 45 degrees uh, temperature. And then you destroy just the small fibers, not the motric fibers. Then it's better, but of course it stay uh, uh, the destruction of the a part of the nerve. What I think is the first thing that we have to do is to release the compression. 
if it doesn't work, we have uh, the possibility to do radio frequency, neuromodulator, or, or, or what you want if it doesn't work. But if you think about when you have a carpal uh, syndrome with compression of the median nerve, the treatment is not to do radio frequency. The treatment is to release the nerve. Yes, and it's the same for all the other nerves. And I think that we should be more logical. We should release the compression. And after, we have still place uh, for the other treatment. Thank you very much, sir. That is a uh, new subject without knowing anything. I asked you questions. Uh, it's a really different subject. Uh, good to know that uh, you have done so much research. But the last question, how, how you applied your brain for pudendal nerve in the beginning part of this subject? What made you to think that pudendal nerve, honestly, what made you to think that pudendal nerve can pathology and compression can be the, what, what made you to think like that? With, Last the with the experience that I have, probably when you have a patient who arrive with a, a functional problem, you have to check if it's not a pitted on nerve. Mm -hmm. Everybody, every day in the consultation, you have at least two or three patients who have a pitted nerve problem. Every day. I promise you, I can do the test uh, I did already uh, in the consultation of some colleagues. And every day you have two or three patients uh, like that. But you have to change completely and you have to, to think maybe it's a pudendal nerve entrapment. Then you ask, uh, uh, we have a list of questions to cover the anorectal symptoms, sexual symptoms, uh, uh, urological symptoms, postural problem. And after you will see that the patient have always the same uh, problem. Then after you have to treat them like if it's a pudendal nerve problem. Then you have to imagine that you have to change completely your mind when you have a premature ejaculation, when you have erectile dysfunction, when you have uh, 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 urgencies, you have to start to first put uh, insulin in the shoes and <laughs> to do physiotherapy. But it's a complete new approach of the, of the functional problem. But probably majority of the functional problem that we treat in a pure symptomatic manner until now uh, is uh, related with the uh, pudendal pathology. Not only the nerve, huh? you have also the artery and the... Uh, and the vein who are, uh, who are responsible of a part of the problem described by the patient. Uh, surprising and uh, if that is the case, a lot of patients, a lot of patients unexplained pathology will be there in our OPD. We have to put up a flight from Hyderabad to Belgium. So, <laughs> they, will, they will come daily. For five. If you are saying 2-3 for India, daily 10 patients will be there. So we, we will also look into it. Uh, I think uh, we, uh, we, at the preliminary level, we have to know the subject. Do you have, do you train this uh, in fellowship also apart from your laparoscopic surgical skills? But I'm, uh, I'm overflowed with the, with the case. Uh, it's happened that some days I operate five uh, pudendal nerves the same day. Then, right. uh, of course, if you come to see, you, you will uh, see uh, pudendal nerves uh, for sure. Uh, it's not a very difficult surgery. It's uh, the most uh, difficult part is uh, the knowledge before and after the surgery. But um, I'm already overflowed with the with the, the pudendal nerve uh, keys. I have patients who send me message from uh, from all around the world. Just before this meeting, I was in the contact with the Indian patient uh, because uh, he has a pudendal nerve, and we were discussing to operate him maybe in Cairo uh, in a few months. Uh, but I think that the most important is not to send me the patient. The most important is to send me the doctors to treat the patients where they are. You cannot imagine in Italy, Italy is 40 million inhabitants. Uh, in Italy, the association is 5,000 patients just in Italy. Then the numbers of keys is a huge number and it's like that uh, everywhere in the world. And, uh, in India, you cannot this. imagine the population is, oh my God. Too much. In fact, yeah. we have yeah. trained uh, before we refer. That's a very, very good. Uh, I'm able to see the passion for teaching, 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 and uh, depth. You are going for the teaching and uh, making to understand what exactly this syndrome is. Hope uh, I will. Uh, I will also try to reach out there and then spend some time. Already, I'm seeing your surgeries for last uh, five, six years. I also do to the extent of intracorporeal uh, neobladders uh, laparoscopy all because of uh, the videos uh, seniors like you have posted uh, now it's 18 years i am practicing laparoscopy i'm very happy to listen this from you sir thank you very much thank you very much for uh, accepting the invitation and any other surgery you wanted to maybe after a couple of months or six months 
What is your favorite surgery in abdomen laparoscopy other than this? Quick. Sorry, what is? Favorite surgery in laparoscopy where you wanted to feel happy to demonstrate? Partial nephrectomy, radical prostatectomy, anything like that? is uh, reconstructive urology because it's never the same. For me, yeah. as a routine, uh, of laparoscopy, I'm not so excited to do one more partial or one more prostate. And uh, when it's reconstructive, it's always more interesting because you have to to think about uh, you have to uh, you need to have a plan A, plan B, plan C. And for me, reconstructive urology complex case is uh, much more interesting. Great, great, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you very much on behalf of Pure Urology. And keep in, we'll keep in touch. Thank you very much.